Hi, welcome to another IELTS video. In this video, we are going to work through mock listening test four together. If you find this video helpful, join us at the forum IELTSnetwork.com. And for more exercises like this one, visit IELTSlisteningBlog.com. Today we want to focus on practicing these listening strategies. So the first is to predict the answer. And uh, this doesn't mean to actually predict what the answer is going to be. It's more predicting what type of word we're going to be listening for, word or words we're going to be listening for, whether it's an adjective or a noun, a date, um, a number, uh, a name, proper noun. So we want to look at the questions that we're given and uh, try to guess what sort of information will be filled in to them. We want to note how the information is organized. Uh, there's always an organizational pattern to every IELTS listening task. So whether it's chronological or, or in uh, groups, we need to figure out how this information is organized and this will help position us as we listen for the answers. We want to note the question words that could be stated in the listening. So for example, if some of the words are in a list and we're asked to choose um, maybe two or three items from that list, if that's the question type, to choose from a list, often these words will appear exactly as they're written in the listening. So we don't have to go searching for a synonym or anything like that. Often the words will, will be exactly as they're listed. And so we want to practice this um, identifying strategy in the listening today. Let's go to the exam itself. I will start the recording. IELTSListeningBlog.com Mock IELTS Listening Test 4 Okay, and so as you know, there's a bit of a preamble in the beginning of any IELTS listening test. So at this point, uh, our, our test papers would be down. Uh, at, uh, uh, when, the, when the recording says turn to section one, we can turn our papers up and we can start focusing on previewing the questions. My advice to you is to, um, it's important to listen to what the recording is saying during this time, but if you've done many practice tests before, you will more or less know what's being said. So you can kind of more focus on what the question types are and uh, start previewing them for, for the exam. 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a father book a birthday party for his son at a children's activity centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Okay, so we're looking for one word and or a number. Uh, so if we look at uh, the answers down here, June, June, these are going to be numbers. Uh, what does fun, which day does Funrunners close? This will be a day of the week. If we look down here, four activities does Funrunners offer on Sunday? Okay, uh, mini You will see that there is an example These will that likely has been be done stated for you. in the listening. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Let's listen for the example. Hello, Funrunners. This is Jenna. How may I help you? Yes, I'm looking to speak to someone about booking my son's birthday party. I can do that for you, sir. How many children will be attending, please? My wife has confirmed approximately 15 thus far, but we're anticipating more. There will also likely be several parents in attendance. Do I need to confirm the number of parents for the bookie? Hmm, OK. It depends on the type of party you'd like to book. If they want to eat with the kids and play games, then I'll need an estimate on the number. The caller indicates the birthday party is for his son. So father has been written in the appropriate section. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, fun runners. This is Jenna. How may I help you? Yes, I'm looking to speak to someone about booking my son's birthday party. I can do that for you, sir. How many children will be attending, please? My wife has confirmed approximately 15 thus far, but we're anticipating more. There will also likely be several parents in attendance. Do I need to confirm the number of parents for the bookie? Hmm, OK. It depends on the type of party you'd like to book. If they want to eat with the kids and play games, then I'll need an estimate on the number. But let's check availability first. 
Uh, what's the date and time of the party, please? June the 15th at 1pm. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but we're booked up solid for June the 15th. Uh, the next available Saturday that I have for a 1pm party would be June 22nd. Would you like me to book you in then? Well, that's no good. My son's birthday is the 17th of June. My wife has already told the other parents to save the date. Hmm, maybe we could ask the parents about Sunday the 16th. Uh, do you have anything available then? Hmm, we don't run all activities on Sundays as we close at 4pm. Uh, but I can book your group in for noon, if that works for you. Do you want me to list what comes with the package? Sure. OK, we have a variety of activities open on Sunday for kids aged 6 through to 16. If you want a basic level package, it'll give the kids each two hours of unlimited activities, including laser tag, games, bumper cars, mini putt and a pizza lunch. The only activity we do not offer on Sundays is the rock climbing wall. We just hired a clown to be on site for the smaller children, and that's gone over really well. You'll also be provided with an activity host. Um, and this person will keep the kids organised and ensure everyone's having a good time. That sounds all right. Let's book a package that will give the kids up to four hours of playtime and a meal. I want to have extra food for the adults, say around ten extra people. Can you arrange this? The maximum amount of playtime is two and a half hours, followed by a meal. We provide a birthday cake for an additional $25, and that feeds up to 20 children. But honestly, I don't think it would feed 15 kids and 10 adults. Mm, all right, we'll take one cake. So long as the kids get some, it should be fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... OK, so before we continue, let's go and review these questions and uh, stick in the, the correct answers. So we're coming up with one word or number. Um, the caller's preferred date for the party. Now, there were several dates that were thrown around there and they, they finally decide on one, but uh, his preferred date was the 15th. So, you should have had that as your answer, 15. Uh, the child's real birth date was June the 17th. Which date is fun runners close at 4 p.m.? The answer here is Sunday. Choose four items from the list, A to F. These sorts of lists often will be stated exactly as they're written in the listening. Not always, but often. And in this case, that's true. So she, the, the woman on the phone, runs through four items that are included. She mentions the rock climbing wall, but she says that this would not be available on Sunday. She does not mention basketball. So the answers here are A, C, D, and F. Answers here, A, C, D, F. Okay, so let's continue with the listening. You have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Okay, only three questions. This should be fairly easy. Uh, choose three items from the list. Which three foods have gluten-free options? Again, uh, these foods will likely be stated exactly as they're written here in the listening. So chicken fingers, cheese, pepperoni pizza, macaroni and cheese, samosas, hot dogs and chips, nachos. key here is gluten-free. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Okay then, Funrunners needs to get a down payment via credit card prior to booking. We also need you to complete our questionnaire outlining what meal you'd like to serve the children. You can do this online once I finish punching it into our system. May I have your name and email for the reservation? Book it under Patrick Morrow. I guess you can send the information to my home email. It's cmorrow, that's M-O-R-R-O-W at yahoo.com M-O-R-R-O-W Yes, are we all set for Sunday? Yeah, I think so. We've got a party of 15 children reserved for Sunday, June 16th at noon. And it's the advanced package, which includes two and a half hours of activity play with lunch and cake, as well as food for ten adults. Good. I will fill out the food choices when I get a moment. Uh, do you have gluten-free options? We do. We have gluten-free cheese or pepperoni pizza slices. We have hot dogs and chips or chicken fingers. Oh, sounds just like a bunch of junk food. Do you have salad or vegetarian options? Hmm, we don't. We have a limited kitchen on site, but would be happy to cater in speciality options for you from our sister site if you don't mind an extra fee. We've got salads and sugarless options. Yes. 
Yes, I would like those options. Please send them to me by email. I will select the ones I need. OK, then. Is there anything else I can help you with today, sir? No. No, thank you. Perfect. Thank you for calling Funrunners, sir. We look forward to having your son's party next weekend. OK. So which three foods have gluten-free options? She mentions chicken fingers, cheese and pepperoni pizza slices, and hot dogs and chips. And uh, the, the man starts to talk about other food options, but um, this is information that we don't need to answer this question. So the answers are A, B, and E. Let's continue. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. We're not going to do that. We're going to continue on to section two to preview here. So choose no more than three words for each answer. Spectral bat details. Okay, listening to uh, information about an animal located in somewhere in America can live in okay, probably a climate, something like that. Very similar to the vampire bat, but the vampire spectrum bat does not. Probably a verb. Hunts using its olfactory system, otherwise known as, okay, keyword here, this will appear in the, in the listening, olfactory. Typically feeds on animals equal to in size two. or... Section 2. You will hear a nature discussion about the spectral bat. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Probably a word to do with its size, number 15. Uh, okay, and then we're going to get more time to look at 16. Anyway, we have time, let's look at them now. Label the spectral bat dimensions of the diagram. These will likely, uh, they will be uh, dimensions probably in centimeters or inches. We'll have to listen for those. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Right, everyone gather around please. Let's get this week's nature group discussion started. Picture a dense forest in Mexico in the dead of night. A thick, warm air hangs as a predator calculates its attack from the bough of a tree. In silence, the predator launches itself downward towards the ground, gliding inches above the thick grass with its three-foot wingspan. With precision, it snatches an unsuspecting mouse in its claws and whisks back up into the dark trees. The night returns to dead silence, and the spectral bat begins to feed. As you may have guessed... I'm going to talk this week about a creature that is little known, the spectral bat, or Vampirum spectrum as it's biologically classified. The spectral bat is the largest species of bat in North and South America, generally localised in Southern Mexico, Ecuador, Peru, Northern Brazil and the island of Trinidad, but not Tobago, strangely enough. The spectral bat tends to inhabit hollow trees, caves or rock crevices, and is even known to nest in man-made structures. As foragers, this species of bat has acclimatised itself to several different habitats, such as dense flora environments like forests, swamps and marshy areas. Its diet, which we'll discuss in a second, is equally varied. The spectral bat is commonly confused with a vampire bat. Although the two species resemble each other physically, they have several other differences, the most prominent being that the spectral bat does not drink the blood of its prey. Spectral bats are patient hunters and use their highly developed olfactual system, otherwise known as a sense of smell, to pinpoint precisely where their prey are located on the forest floor in the dead of night. In fact, spectral bats are such skilled hunters that their attack success rate is among the highest of all mammals in South America. Feeding on animals its size or smaller, the spectral bat typically uses its claws and jaws to crush the bodies of its prey prior to consuming. Its diet is made up predominantly of other bats, birds, small rodents, amphibians and lizards. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions. Okay, let's go over the answers very quickly for this section. Spectral bat details located in, and this was a very straightforward answer, North and South America. Can live in, I believe he says... It has several different habitats that, that it, uh, it can live in. So a, a word that would fit here would be varied. Varied environments. Very similar to the vampire bat, but the vampire spectrum does not, and you probably caught it, drink blood. Hunting using its olfactory system. Now you, you heard that keyword in the listening, and then he goes on to explain that 
This is a word that means the sense of smell. And we knew that this was going to be a noun because we had a. Ah. Typically feeds on animals equal in size or uh, we knew it was going to be something about size, smaller. And then he shares information that we don't need. It, it eats small lizards, it eats other bats. Okay, let's continue. 16 to 20. Okay, previewing 16 to 20. We already talked about those. Let's look at these ones. Write the correct letter, A, B, C, D, E, next to the questions. Okay, dark orange or rust in color. Now these look like different parts of the, of the bat, uh, body fur, rounded ears, wings, membrane, located between its legs, used by males to keep mates and offspring warm. Offspring means its babies, mates means uh, the animal that it has produced the babies with. So it looks like we're going to have to match these body parts with these descriptions. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. As I alluded to in my intro, the Vamprum spectrum has a wingspan that can extend up to three feet and a body length of six to eight inches. The very short stubby fur on the upper parts of its body is generally dark or chestnut brown or rust orange in colour. It has rounded large ears and a long narrow muzzle, but is most distinguishable by its lance-shaped nose leaf. Unlike many other species of bat, the spectral bat has a flap of membrane between its legs instead of a tail. Spectral bats mate once per year and typically only produce a single pup. Both adults are attentive to their offspring and will habitually sleep together with the wings of the male enveloping the mother and her young. Similarly, both parents will assist in the feeding routine while roosting and will continue to do so until the young reaches full independence. Most births have been recorded to occur between May and July, which correlates with the transition from dry to rainy seasons. The Vamprum spectrum is rarely preyed upon by other animals. Although certain snake species have been known to hunt baby spectral bats from the nest, by far the most major cause of the decline in spectral bat numbers is climate change and ecosystem destruction due to human activity. Despite this, spectral bats are not yet on the endangered species list and enjoy population numbers much greater than many other bat species. OK, right? You should now be able to distinguish the Vamprum spectral species from other bats. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section two. Okay, uh, let's go back and punch in these numbers here. Uh, so right away we found out the answer to this one. The length of the vampire vampire spectrum's uh, wings can be three feet, he says, long. And if we want to just uh, standardize, so we're going to put three feet here and then we'll put uh, digits here as well. And the wings, or the body is uh, six to eight inches. Write the correct letter. Uh, dark orange or rust in color. This was the body fur. And we had to be um, quick because the answers for the previous questions came almost at the exact same time as the answers for these questions. So this is the body fur located between its, its legs. This is a membrane used by males to keep mates and offspring warm. Uh, so he doesn't use this vocabulary in, his, in when he's talking about it. He says the male will envelop or cover the female and any babies with its wings. So the answer here would be D. Let's continue. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Let's go ahead to section three and preview the questions. Okay, we're talking about Diwali. Why do so many Canadians celebrate Diwali? Uh, because Diwali closely resembles Christmas, because it's a national holiday, because Canada is ethnically diverse. A variety of religions celebrate Diwali for different reasons. Why, uh, which is not an example of why Diwali is celebrated. Okay, Rama. Now, who is Rama? I'm sure this will appear in our listening. Rama's return after exile. Rama's surrender to Ravana, another person that we'll hear. The continuing battle now turn of to good section over three. evil. Section 3. You will hear a radio show discuss the celebration of Diwali. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Diwali is celebrated by Hindus, Sikhs and Jains exclusively, keyword here, by people of varied religious backgrounds, by people whose ancestors celebrated Diwali. Okay, we'll have to listen for some keywords there. Diwali is marked by an official holiday in some countries outside of South Asia because 
interest in Indian culture and cuisine is high. The history of British colonialism in India. I, okay, a lot of these are going to be focusing on key language. So uh, try to listen for a couple of these words that we've highlighted. If, we, if they talk about British colonialism at all, it's probably answer B. Um, Indian immigration to countries like Canada. Perhaps. Let's listen. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Welcome back to CKOV 93.4 FM, live with Richard and Alan. On this week's cultural roundup, we'll be discussing the ancient Hindu festival of Diwali, or Deepavali, also better known as the Festival of Lights. With almost a million Indo-Canadians, some of the biggest celebrations occur right here in Canada. That's especially true in cities with large Indo-Canadian communities, such as Toronto and Vancouver, and the surrounding cities of Brampton and Surrey. Diwali celebrations date back thousands of years. For many Hindus, Diwali represents the perseverance of good over evil and the struggle of light versus darkness. It celebrates the victory of the god Rama over Ravana and Rama's return after 14 years of exile. To mark the original event, it is said that 20 candles were lit in a row to celebrate Deepavali, which is the ancient Sanskrit for a row of lamps. Over time, Deepavali was shortened to Diwali, which is the modern name we know the festival by today. To mark the modern version of the festival, candles are lit, homes are decorated with bright lights, and sweets and gifts are handed out. You know, Ellen, doesn't that remind you a lot of Christmas? The lights, candles, and the exchanging of gifts? It does, Richard. It's got all the hallmarks of Christmas, save for the tree and reindeer. But, all jokes aside, Diwali is just as important to Hindus as Christmas is to Christians. The really striking thing about Diwali is just how important it is in South Asia, not just for Hindus, but almost everyone. It's unique because it extends beyond religious barriers. Hindus, Sikhs, and Jains all celebrate one form of Diwali or another across South Asia. It extends even past South Asia, Richard. It's not only a national holiday in India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and other South Asian countries, but it's also a holiday in Fiji, and has even spread to the Western Hemisphere in places like Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. Movements of a sizable East Indian community within the British Empire brought Diwali to the New World several centuries ago. Really fascinating how that happened. I think even more amazing is that these groups haven't always gotten along, but they still share a common holiday. Three religions on three continents and just one really big holiday. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time. Okay, so let's go through these questions. Why do so many Canadians celebrate Diwali? Uh, It's not because it resembles Christmas. Uh, It's because Canada is ethnically diverse. So they were mentioning that there are large Indo-Canadian populations. And this is uh, the reason why it's a very popular holiday. So the answer here would be C. A variety of religions celebrate Diwali for different reasons, which is not an example of why Diwali is celebrated. Uh, Now, they talk about Rama's return after exile. Uh, They talk about, uh, I can't remember exactly what they said, something about light over darkness, good over evil. The reason uh, that doesn't fit or that they didn't talk about was Rama's surrender to Ravana. So remember, I mean, the word not here is in bold and it's caps. Rama's surrender to Ravana is... The reason uh, is an example of why Diwali is not an example of why Diwali is celebrated. Diwali is celebrated by Hindus, Sikhs, and Jains exclusively. Now they mention Hindu, Sikhs, and Jains for sure. Um, exclusively, though, no, because they they mention that there were several uh, religions all over the world in addition to these three that celebrate Diwali by people of varied religious backgrounds. Yes, could be by people whose ancestors celebrated Deepavali. Um, no real mention of that, so the answer would be B. Diwali is marked as an official holiday in some countries outside of South Asia because interest in Indian culture and cuisine is high. Could be, but there's no mention uh, of the history of British colonialism in India and the West Indies. Yes, likely, because they, they mentioned that this brought with it certain cultures, uh, certain cultural practices and religious practices. So likely, number B, Indian immigration to countries like Canada. Um, No real clear mention of that. The answer here is B. Conversation. You have some time to look at questions 25 to 28. Okay, so let's quickly go through these. Uh, There is blank among the manner in which Hindu communities celebrate Diwali. 
probably an adjective or a noun. Uh, Sikhs used Diwali to commemorate the release of the sixth guru. This will appear in the listing for sure. This is a name which is believed to have occurred in the year, a number, of course. Otherwise known in Rangoli are created. So some things can be a noun created using rice, flour, and sand. Uh, purpose of welcoming Hindu gods. This will likely appear in the listening too. They are sometimes adorned with, which means to be decorated with something. So listen for that. Now listen and answer questions 25 likely to 28. A noun. Ironically, Hindus, Sikhs, and Jains all celebrate Diwali for different reasons and use the festival to commemorate different things. There's even variation among the Hindu communities themselves. For example, the killing of Narakasura by Lord Krishna is an especially important religious event in Nepal. Sikhs, on the other hand, celebrate the release of the Sikh Guru from the prison of Emperor Jahangir in 1619. For Jains, it dates back two and a half millennia to 527 BC, where according to ancient tradition, Mahavira, a very important spiritual leader, attained Nirvana, the complete liberation of the soul. Such a rich history. But you know, Diwali celebrations also create breathtaking and extremely elaborate artwork. I get to see it firsthand. Oh really? How's that? Well, every year my neighbors create the most stunning floor decorations as part of Diwali celebrations. My kids can't get enough of them. They always impress us. Our neighbors make them by spreading rice, flour, and sand in intricate and beautiful patterns using traditional motifs called rangoli. They'll even put flower petals on them. It's meant as an elaborate sign of welcome to important deities. I bet it's a job trying to stop the kids from touching them. It is, but I wind up handing that task over to my wife. Poor Susan. I'm just kidding. But you're right. Getting children not to touch the intricate patterns is a real test. I traveled to India after college and saw many of those patterns in public places. It's almost the equivalent of the street art in Canada, since it's so ubiquitous. Just a little less permanent, right? Yes. And I guess a little more tasteful. Graffiti's often an unwelcomed addition to a city. I think we can conclude that what Canada needs is more Diwali. Yes. All right. On that note, listeners, we're signing off on this week's Cultural Rounder. We hope you've learned more about Canada's cultural mosaic and the significance of Diwali celebrations. Next week, join us as we talk about one of Mexico's most infamous holidays, Dia de los Muertos, or the Day of the Dead. Stay tuned for more of CKOV 94.3 FM. That is the end of... Se okay, so uh, let's go over the answers here. Uh, so for number 25, there is among the manner in which Hindu communities celebrate Diwali, and they mention that there are, are uh, differences so I suppose we could write that, or we could write uh, the word variation. So there is, uh, because um, the sentence begins with there is, so if we want to keep it grammatically correct, we use variation. Sikhs used Diwali to commemorate the release of the sixth guru. As we predicted, this was shared. Actually, I believe the, the uh, I believe it was the woman mentioned the, she stated the entire sentence, pretty much word for word. And this is uh, believed to have occurred in the year, and then uh, she shares the year 1619. Otherwise known as Rangoli are created using rice, flour, and sand for the purpose of welcoming Hindu gods. So this was floor decorations, you could write. That would be correct, or motif floor patterns. But floor decorations would be fine too. They are sometimes adorned with, they are sometimes decorated with, and then the answer is flower petals. Okay, so as we, we predicted, obviously this was going to be a date, and these two are nouns. Let's continue. Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So once again, we are going to preview the next section. Uh, okay, complete, uh, choose no more than three words. Um, these look like notes of some kind and lots of gesturing. So this is uh, likely the topic. Gesturing is used by probably a noun to communicate a message. Gesturing is controlled by the same area of the brain that controls, okay, listen for brain. Gesturing means different things when exercised in, and then we're given an example. The example probably appears in what we're listening to. Thumbs up at a taxi stand. A glad now turn around. to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture on the subject of human gesturing. First, 
You have some time to look at questions 29 to 40. Okay, gesturing has no message. So likely an adjective. Message is, uh, it is meaning given by something. This is also true for, okay, listen for two things. We must therefore broaden our definition of language. Gesturing has become a part, an adjective in here, of spoken English. I give that album a thumbs up. Another example. Let's listen for this example. Society has in gestures ability to communicate. Uh, gesture is becoming universal because of another example. Listen for in most places today. Thumbs up. Uh, gesturing is at this moment. Okay, um, might be a verb or uh, an adjective. Modern gesturing, mobile phone use. Some more examples. Looks like an example with a comma and a comma around now it. Now listen carefully and, then a third and answer example. questions 29 to 40. The ongoing evolution of gesture. Providing a congratulatory high five in celebration, avoiding the use of the left hand while eating, demonstrating respect through bowing the head. These are all examples of widely used and misused gestures. But where do the cultural variations among gestures stem from? And why do human beings gesture at all when we have perfectly good spoken language? In the following lecture, I am going to examine the science behind gesturing, its sensitivity to context, and the relationship between gestures and the spoken word. At the heart of gesturing is the desire to communicate. We humans are not alone in this desire. As I'm sure you've seen on any nature TV show, animals use all sorts of gestures to communicate a message like, for example, that they are fertile and in need of a mate. In the human brain, gesturing is controlled by the same area that produces speech, and this has led to all sorts of interesting discoveries regarding how we communicate. Let's use the renowned thumbs up as a case study. The thumbs up gesture is performed by extending your thumb upwards while closing your other fingers into a fist. While the exact origin of the sign is unclear, it is a gesture that has been adopted by most societies throughout history and not all of them associated the gesture with affirmation. Thus, the context within which a gesture is exercised is key. What would the thumbs up represent when one is standing in front of a taxi stand? What does it mean when accompanied by a sarcastic expression? What would you be communicating as a spectator in a Roman gladiator ring? As these rhetorical questions demonstrate, our thumbs possess no intrinsic message by themselves. The message is only delivered after it has been filtered through a society's predetermined meaning for the gesture. The same is of course true for spoken language, which is really nothing more than sounds being projected and interpreted by a predefined code of understanding. It is for this reason that we must broaden how we have traditionally defined language. In fact, the thumbs up gesture has now become a metaphorical part of spoken English. Commonly, you hear people describe restaurants, movies and music with language like, I give that album a thumbs up, or my friends and I feel that movie deserves a thumbs down. This use of the spoken word to describe a physical cue indicates our confidence in a gesture's ability to communicate a message. Perhaps we feel the gesture communicates our message better than our words do. Now, it's important to remember that culture, and with it language, are in a constant state of evolution. Thus, with the world's cultures becoming more and more alike through globalization, it is no surprise that gestures too are becoming universal. In some Asian countries, for example, giving someone a thumbs up was at a time seen as offensive or even aggressive, akin to raising a middle finger in the Western world today. But now there are very few places anywhere that view a thumbs up as anything but affirmative. Take this a step further and you'll notice how gesturing is evolving all around you at this very moment. For example, it is not uncommon today for people in public situations to poke at their iPhones in an effort to communicate to those around them that they do not want to be bothered. Emoticons on a computer are usually cartoonish representations of physical gestures. Flicking your high beams in your car. All of these are examples of the dynamic and evolving power of gesture. So when you leave this room today, try to notice your gesturing and the gesturing around you. 
being conscious of how we gesture can make us better communicators. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, let's go through these uh, answers. So gesturing is used by, and she clearly states um, humans or people, people and animals. And animals. Gesturing is controlled by the same area of the brain that controls the answer there is speech, and she says this answer almost word for word. Gesturing means different things when exercised in, and as we predicted, she shared both examples. So a thumbs up at a, ta at a taxi stand is different than a thumbs up at a gladiator uh, ring. Uh, so the answer here would be exercised in different contexts, which is what she said in, in her... Uh, in her lecture. Gesturing has no message. And the word she used was intrinsic. Message is meaning given by, and then again, I think she states this almost word for word, it's given by society. This is also true for And uh, she equates this to spoken language. Oops. Okay, uh, we must therefore broaden our definition of language. This is a nice little marker because um, when we hear her say this, we know that you know everything before it has been has been said. So we know that we can start focusing on the uh, the remaining questions. Gesturing has become a part of spoken English. I give that album's album a thumbs up. And she used the word metaphorical. Uh, society has in gestures ability to communicate a message. So she mentioned something about society having... Um, grown a certain confidence to the ability of a gesture to uh, communicate a message. So the answer here is confidence. Gesturing is becoming universal because of globalization. And depending on what part of the world you come from, this is spelled differently. So we better stick to the British spelling. Um, a thumbs up is in most places today. So I think she shares an example of um, how before in some parts of Asia, a thumbs up was negative. So today, most places see a thumbs up as affirmative. Gesturing is at this moment. And she says it's evolving at this moment. Modern gesturing. Uh, so then she gives three examples, mobile phone use, Flicking high beams in a car. The middle one was emoticons, like we see uh, on the internet. Okay, and that concludes the fourth mock listening test. I hope you found the exercise helpful. For more, come join me at ieltsnetwork.com. And for additional exercises like this one, please go to ieltslisteningblog.com. Thanks for watching and have a nice afternoon.